Hey, this is Jody with WeldingTipsAndTricks.com. Today we're doing part two of a series on 6G pipe welding tips. Today's the hot pass. Last week we did the root pass and just touched on the hot pass just a little bit. We're going to back up a little bit and talk about the amperage ranges for the root pass. If you got a little bit of a big gap, a little bit bigger than 1 8th, like a 532, about 65 amps seem to work pretty well. Uh, for, the, for this joint. And then a little bit, uh, if you got an eighth inch gap, 70 to 75, this is using the dip keyhole technique, and then 80 to 85 if you got a little bit of a tight gap, like a 332. So here's a, a wide gap, like about a 532nd, set at 65 amps. And that looks something like this, where you're just barely keyholing. It's a slow process when you're using the dip keyhole technique. You just barely watch, you're barely watching those corners of the land keyhole and just. Uh, not getting crazy, keeping that rod in there, keeping the puddle satisfied, and just you just keep going like this. Now, if you got a little bit narrower gap, about a one eighth, about 70 amps, seems to be about right, at least on the machine I was using. It looks relatively the same, but it, obviously a narrower gap is going to take a little bit more amperage. A wider gap takes less amperage, or you'll just get it'll just get out of control with you. You don't want that thing keyholing uh, too bad, or on the bottom it'll suck back. You feed enough rod, and you don't keyhole much. Even on the bottom, you can push it through a little bit, especially if you can feed the rod a little bit toward the inside of the uh, of the pipe. Again, this is kind of a slow. A slow technique, but it's kind of a, a tried and true method for root passes. Now, this is just barely wider than a 332nd here, so I'm turning it up to 80 amps. You can see that's a hotter puddle, not moving much side to side because the gap is narrow. It'd be hard for me to push it through on the bottom like that. And then, of course, 90 amps sometimes is just out of control unless you've got a very narrow gap and you're on the top and you're really trying to push it through. You can see the keyhole is just kind of getting getting a little bit crazy here. You want to control the puddle. You don't want to fight it. That's a little bit too too hot. Okay. So once the root passes in, it's time for the hot pass. Now. A good tip is let the root pass cool off until you can basically put your hand on it without burning yourself. It can be warm, it can be even kind of really warm, but you don't want to fire up on it right after you get done with the root pass. You don't want to go to all that trouble of putting a really a good root pass in there only to melt through and suck back and, and screw it up. So take the time, go get a drink of water, take your jacket off, do whatever it takes to make yourself wait. You don't want to speed cool it, you don't want to quench it, but you don't want to weld on it while it's hot. So coming off the bottom now with that hot pass, you might have noticed I bent the wire a little bit, a couple inches up from it, kind of helped me get get a bead on it. And I'm using a TIG finger, otherwise my fingers would just be smoking right now. But I got a nice steady prop, using my left hand, and it looks something like this. You're not spending much time across the middle, and I'm keeping the wire in the puddle. That kind of keeps the root pass chilled a little bit. And a hot pass is, uh, the word hot pass indicates you're going to be welding hot, but for TIG, sometimes you weld the same amperage as the root, sometimes about 10 to 15 amps more. It just depends on how heavy of a root pass you put in there. And with this dip keyhole technique, it puts a heavier root pass in there than a lay wire, so it actually is less likely that you'll uh, melt through it by having a heavier root. And you can see I'm pretty much filling this joint up with just the hot pass. Not really feeding any wire, but I'm keeping a little pressure on it pressure on the wire so if it wants it I'm going to let it take the wire because I don't want it pulling root pass metal from the inside I'd rather feed it from the outside keep the puddle satisfied now this pass this is a little bit on the hot side right here puddles staying hot most of the way across it probably should turn it down about five amps from there okay again now this is my easy side you don't need to rush it you can let it cool a little bit after that first side of the hot pass too Otherwise, you might, you know, risk again uh, sucking back because when the, when the metal's hot, it's almost like having more amperage. So unless you have a foot pedal where you can control things, 
you'd be better off if you let it cool a little bit. So this is my easy side coming up this way, my right-handed side. You can see I'm just going nice little straight weave. Trying not to nip the corners, but I'm trying to come out to the corners. I'd like to have a nice straight line there to follow when I either, uh, depending on what kind of test this was, whether it was TIG all the way or TIG stick, still want a straight line to follow for the cover pass. And you can see, or you can imagine, going along nice and slow like this, that pipe gets really hot. If you don't have a place to prop your fingers, you either got to grip the torch way back far or use something to use the TIG finger like, like, like I'm using here and you can, you can prop on the pipe. A steady hand, just plain welds better than one that's hot and shaky. On a 6G, you're always having to reposition yourself. You got to think ahead a little bit, think of where your body needs to be in the next five to ten seconds and you kind of got to be moving all the time. That's what makes it hard. That's why they use 6G for the test. Of course, the smaller the diameter pipe, the more you're moving to reposition yourself. This is why a lot of people give a two-inch test to test the welder. They know if you can make a two-inch test, odds are you can do a six or an eight-inch pretty easily. Here I'm just dipping the wire instead of laying it in there just to show you that technique. All right, time for a unashamed promotion here. If you've been following my videos any time at all, you know I put out one a week and I go to quite a bit of effort to do it. And the only way I can keep doing it is to make a little money every now and then. So I've got a good product here. It'll help you if you're welding pipe or anything else practically if you need a place to prop for TIG welding. So I'm going to show some examples here of where this TIG finger really shines and really comes in handy. Something small bore like this, small tubing or pipe where you need a place to prop and there's no place to readily prop. You can prop right next to the weld and you're good to go. Sure, you could set up some 4 by 4s and, and whatnot, clamp a pair of vice grips on there and figure out a place to prop, but when you got a TIG finger in your pocket, you can take it out and you can prop right next to the weld. It just makes things go easier. If you're in school or welding small aluminum pieces, you know how hot they get, how quickly. This is an aluminum lap joint welding vertical uphill. I've either got to prop way out from, uh, rest my elbow on that vice grip there, and be less steady or I can prop right on the metal and slide right on up. Here's an outside corner joint, same thing. I can prop right right on the piece and that thing's going to get hot quick. Like about five seconds after I light up on it, if I don't have the TIG finger on, my finger's going to be screaming. With it, I got no problems. I can just run the whole joint. And there you have it. Hey, where'd that come from? Who put that there? That's a distraction. All right, T-joints like this make a trough, and they really push the heat onto your fingers sometimes. So this is a case where even sometimes wearing a couple of TIG fingers might even, might even come in handy. But definitely, one, lets you prop and, and, uh, and zip right on up that thing and lets it slide right along that metal nice and smoothly and lets you make a nice smooth weld. Chromoly cluster joints for aircraft fuselages and odd saddle joints like this kind of hard to find a place to prop but again when you got a steady hand because you got a steady prop the weld's just going to come out better in welding school learning to weld a, a two inch pipe joint get ready to go take a test I cut the thumb out of an old stick glove and it helped but believe me, it was not nearly as good. TIG fingers made out of high heat resistant material and lets you lay in there a whole lot longer than just some leather off of, off of a stick glove. All right, that's it for the commercial. We're going back to the 6G tips. And you can see I'm still using the TIG finger for the stick part of this, but it's because it works. 
You might notice how I've got my rod in there. I've got it like backwards angled a little bit and also choked up on it about two inches because I don't want a long, long rod there and that'll still make it from bottom to top. Let's me have a steadier, a steadier arc by shortening up the rod just a little bit. But this is the way I do a 6G small bore like this. I prop with a pinky and uh, do a little pinky to thumb collapse and I'm going to speed it up here in a minute and so you can see. You always want to aim for the center of the pipe with, with your rod. So that lets me change my rod angle and collapse as, it, as the rod shortens up. And that lets me go from bottom to top without stopping and that's a good thing because you don't want any more tie-ins than you need on a test. Well, that's it for today. So just go to the bottom of this uh, YouTube video if you're on YouTube and look for that description box. The blue link will take you to the store on the Welding-TV website and order your TIG finger and do it now.